Welcome. I'm Jeremy Siegel. I'm a co-host of Morning Edition at GBH, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this month's Beyond the Page with Jonathan Franzen. In a few minutes, we will be joined by Jonathan Franzen, a novelist and essayist whose sprawling, multi-layered novels about contemporary America have elicited a lot of critical acclaim. His novels combine brilliant storytelling while exploring intimate family connections and relations. Franzen is the author of six novels, most recently Crossroads and Purity, and five works of nonfiction. His 2001 novel, The Corrections, won the National Book Award and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Since then, he has become a national bestseller and has been cited by Barack Obama, Financial Times, Good Housekeeping, Oprah Daily, Newsweek, NPR, Publishers Weekly, Time, USA Today, Vogue, I could probably name every single publication in existence. And now before I welcome Jonathan on screen with me, I want to explain for everybody in the audience how this evening's event will work. We are using Zoom webinar, and as our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time during our conversation this evening, and we'll do our best to address as many questions as we can throughout the night. Beyond the Page is a really exciting event to be a part of because it's different than many author interviews where so much of this is going to be your questions. You really have a great opportunity here to put your questions to Jonathan Franzen. And throughout the evening, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, you can actually vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab. And the most popular questions will rise up to the top of that list. To activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, you can select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. There you will select live transcript. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now that housekeeping is done, it is my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Franzen. John, welcome. Okay, I've unmuted, and here I am starting my video. We can see Hello, you. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to talk with you. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. And so I think many, many people in the audience will have read your most recent book, Crossroads. And if they're like me, they're eagerly awaiting what's next in this planned trilogy. But just in case there are people who are planning on reading it or haven't read it yet, I'm wondering if you could just lay out in your words <clears throat> what the story you aim to tell in Crossroads is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I wrote the book as I have several of my recent novels uh, with the refrain uh, on a regular basis, what is the story? But yes, what is the story? Um, so that should seem, that would be an easy question, um, but it's actually not that easy a question. What story was I telling? I was, oh God. Um, well, I, I was telling a story about five characters uh, and they happen to be related uh, by being part of the same family. Um, and uh, I was trying to actually this time, for the first time, write a family novel, uh, as opposed to a novel in which there's a family, um, because if that's a family novel, then like half of Western literature uh, consists of family novels. Um, and, 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 and what is the story? The story is, well, I can describe elements of it. It's set mostly in 1971. Shortly before Christmas, it's about the family of a Protestant minister back when there was such a thing as liberal Christianity. Um, but really, you have to bear down on what each character's story is. I don't think the book as a whole is 
it's not trying to tell the story of America in 1971. That was the farthest thing from my mind. Um, and I, I, it was not a theological investigation, although religion is important in it. God is a character in the book for a number of the characters. Um, so I'm actually kind of stumped, Jeremy. What, 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 what is the story I'm telling in, in Crossroads? It's oh. <laughs> get, get, get to know the five characters in turn, and they each have, they each have a problem, and those problems all intersect um, uh, with the problems of the other main characters. It's interesting how you mention um, this, in your view, being your first family novel, because for people who are familiar with your work, I'm sure they know that family does play a central role in um, so many of your recent works. And I was thinking recently about the generational shift that I felt going through um, your three previous works leading up to Crossroads, um, how you often include three generations of characters in families. Um, if you're putting yourself in that family's shoes, you might think of sort of the grandparent, the parent, parent and then the children. And to me, um, the corrections, at least with the ending in many ways, felt like it ended on the note of the grandparents and freedom with Walter and Patty felt like it ended in spirit with the parents and with purity, I felt an ending that was much more youthful in spirit um, with Pip. And it's funny going to Crossroads where, of course, we don't have the ending because it's a trilogy, but it feels like your approach to family is really different. I'm, I'm curious like how you thought about the elements of generation in writing this and how it relates to your previous works. Well, this was supposed to be the first part of a, a single novel that would um, would track the family forward in time by maybe five decades. Um, so we would be getting to know what would be the grandparents or even great grandparents 50 years later in the form of Russ and Marion, the two grown up characters in this book. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then the then the book got out of hand. Um, I, I was so enjoying being in 1971 that I decided to make a whole book out of it. Um, but really, I started with a character. I started with one character and I thought, oh, there's a novel there. So somebody I met in real life and I, 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 I knew just a few facts about him. I really liked him. Um, and so I basically imagined what he would have been like 50 years earlier. Uh, and in that sense, I, the, the whole, all along, I was thinking in terms of multiple generations and, and, you know, there's a little of that in the previous novels, but that is to me, one of the hallmarks of a family novel is you have multiple generations and you really have time to see patterns repeating themselves, not just in two generations, but in three or even four generations, um, both genetic patterns, patterns of thought all the ways in which uh, we are inescapably the product of who we come from. Who was the person who inspired or which character, if you're willing to share, did Crossroads start? One, one of the children in the book. I, okay. I'd rather not say. For Sorry. people who are eagerly awaiting the, um, the follow-ups in the series, um, you said that you were planning close to five generations. Is that is that still what you're planning going forward? Yeah, you know, my plans are are essentially worthless. I have plans, uh, but I I I can't seem to follow them. Um, and you know, no one is more eagerly awaiting the next book than I am. But uh, I've learned to have to be patient with myself. Um, uh, <clears throat> So, yeah, it could be I'm, I'm not cut out to write that kind of book, um, in which case I have promised two sequels, but they might not look like, you know, the last two thirds of Budenbrooks or something. Well, you Sorry are... to be cagey, but I mean, it's like, uh, it, it's so easy to make plans. Sure, yeah. And it's so easy to make an outline. And I know everything that happens, and I know the order in which it happens. What what should be so hard? Just write write it as a book. But um, you know, novels are not uh, systems for conveying 
uh, information. They have their own logic and they have, and, and, and each one t needs to actually be its own thing. And, uh, and you also have to consider the author. Is the author still interested in these characters? Um, uh, if the author did his job in the first book, he, he or she or they should have, um, should have told you pretty much everything you need to know about the characters. So it's a, it's, it's a very strange feeling for me to be thinking, oh, but now I need to go back and in essence say, I, you know, you thought you were learning the most important things about these characters, but in fact, there are other important things and now I'm gonna tell you, but first I have to think them up. Um, so it's tricky. I mean, I'm giving you, uh, it's sort of shop talk and maybe we should get off this subject. Uh, the whole matter of the sequels is um, by a, a mile, my least favorite topic. That must be, I mean, a really odd experience to um, sitting on on something that, that you're still going to be working on. I'm curious, like, well, you are, you know, going to be prepping for the next book or when you previously have, I know a lot of your time is taken up with reading. Um, right now, what are you reading? Um, I just started a book of short stories by my friend Juan Gabriel Vasquez. Um, <clears throat> it's his most recent book in English. Uh, before that, I was rereading Hamler, Ham, <laughs> Faulkner's The Hamlet. Um, not coincidentally, the first in a trilogy about the Snopes family. I thought, oh, let's go take a look. Uh, um, and always with Faulkner and as with anyone, I worry, maybe I read this when I was young and it's actually not that good. Um, but there I was laughing aloud. The Hamlet is his funniest book. Uh, what else have I been reading um, lately? Um, the New Yorker. Um, uh, I'm casting my mind. My, well, <laughs> move on. I, if I think of something else, I'll let you know. I mean, well, I there mean, are there are many other books, but I've um, yeah. I, I, I've been rereading Faulkner uh, and finding him as good as I remembered. When you are reading, um, how much do you feel like it informs the way that you approach your own writing and getting into characters? Because I think um, with Crossroads and with many of your previous novels, like it is really astounding as a reader to feel so intensely like you're taken into the mindset of characters, many characters who um, you know, at least when you're writing from their perspective, they're much younger than you, or they're a different gender than you. Um, thinking about a character like Becky in Crossroads, who's so fully realized, and when you're reading it, you know, you feel like you are Becky, or, um, you know, you feel like you are Walter in Freedom. How do you approach getting into the space of different characters, especially characters who have such different life experiences than your own? Are you using people that you know? Are you placing like elements of your own childhood into theirs or? I've kind of used up all the people I know. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've spent most of my writing life not writing um, and very specifically most of my life not writing novels. I mean, it's maybe eight years I've spent writing six novels uh, and um, a lot of time wasted. Um, and at a certain point you start making lists for like, who, who, who I'm gonna make a list of everyone I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything left there? Um, <clears throat> the, it, it's where the characters come from and how I do it. I mean, that is, that is my focus as a writer. Uh, it has been for a long time and is now my total focus. I am trying to create interesting three-dimensional characters. Uh, and obviously that's a many year process, which is hard to summarize briefly, but I try, um, I try to, it does help to have someone in mind, uh, somebody I've met, but the, the main thing is trying to figure out what they want, um, what the individual character wants. And it doesn't have to be a large thing, but, uh, Desire is super, super key in fiction. Um, if if a, if you read about someone who wants something, you 
and really, really wants something, needs something, um, there's this kind of magical thing that happens where you start wanting and needing that thing yourself and worrying about whether the character is going to get it uh, and being frustrated when the character doesn't. Um, and that is, that is the thing I'm looking for. Um, and it's a lot of trial and error. As a reminder for everybody who's listening, if you want to ask a question um, for Jonathan Franzen at any point, if you want to ask him anything, please add your questions to the Q&A tab that is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will do the be our best to get to everybody's uh, question. John, I'm sorry, I think I interrupted you there when I was reminding people. No, no, um, you didn't. I, I was pursuing a thought from an earlier question, trying to find something more interesting to say about it, but- um, uh, That was can... the way you were reading, did you? <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, it was, it was, um, no, I, well, I know what it was. Um, so the Crossroads, it was, a, it was a really happy experience in Toto, a miserable anxiety about whether I actually had a book for the whole two years I spent writing it. But, um, but it was ideal in that I didn't see that book coming. Um, and, and I think that bears on your question about characters too. Um, it's, I, I, I don't want to start knowing a lot. I want to discover um, what might be done with a character. Um, I, I want to be surprised. Uh, I don't want to write from an outline. I don't want the character to do what I determined in advance the character is supposed to do. This is not to say that the character takes over. The character is, doesn't exist. The character is something in my mind. I'm making up the character. Nevertheless, I know the, the work starts to go well when I feel like, oh, I, well, this is, this is a, something I hadn't thought of. Let's pursue that and see where it goes. Um, that's when I'm happiest as a and writer. So you don't, you don't outline in advance? Not, not very much, no. There, was, there were a few things that happened in Crossroads. I knew they had to happen, uh, especially back in the days when I thought I was just writing the first part of a novel. I'm setting up stuff that happens decades later. But um, no, no, I don't, don't like outlines very much. Because, while we're talking, oh, go, yeah. sorry, go, no, go ahead. Interrupt. Well, I was going to say, while we are talking about um, process a little bit, we have a bunch of questions that are coming in um, asking about advice or the process that you use writing. Sure. The uh, top one here is from Teresa, who asked, what is the best piece of writing advice that you've received <laughs> that you still use in your own writing? And while we're asking that, I'd love to hear if, if you're willing to share who gave you the advice. My standard answer, and it still holds up, um, even though it was said in, in gendered language, um, is Don DeLillo writing to me, the writer leads, he doesn't follow. Um, and that was in the context of representing contemporary reality. You don't want to be chasing after what's already in the news. You want to have the confidence to say, I know what you think is important, but here's what I think is important. Um, and you're not paying attention to it and I'm gonna make you pay attention to it. There is, there is, there's more, I think that that line of his, the writer leads he doesn't follow means more than it, the words themselves say. They were, it was basically, um, Stop worrying about your cultural relevance. Stop worrying about what other people think. Do what you need to do. And that, that advice came when I was really struggling with my third novel. And it was very much on my mind when I painfully accepted that what I needed to do was write a novel about a woman who wants the family to come together for Christmas. Um, it's interesting you say that about um, leading and saying what you want about what's happening around you because Crossroads felt like a shift a little bit from uh, the corrections and freedom where it's not contemporary at least this first part of uh, the trilogy isn't contemporary the trilogy, do you feel like the trilogy <laughs> do you feel like you uh, are um, trying to say something about contemporary culture with what you're writing about I mean thinking about some of the characters like I think you could read into some situations feeling like 
you were maybe talking about cancel culture um, or um, perhaps the way like previous generations relationships with religion um, are informing the way religion and politics are interconnected and shaping us now. Were you thinking much about commenting on contemporary society with what you're writing about in the 70s or was that not a thought? Not at all? <laughs> That's a zero. That's a zero. No, we have a very, very well commented on culture. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the last thing we need is more cultural commentary, I think. You know, there are things you can find. There are contemporary relevances that you can find in Crossroads, but they are there. I, they're, they're put there because of the story I was telling, not because I had any interest in weighing in on what's happening. Um, I mean, I do more of that in my nonfiction, but but not in the fiction. I really, this was the book in which I deliberately stayed in the past so that I would not even be tempted to try to represent, let alone comment on what's happening in the world now. Um, <clears throat> so no, a, a zero, zero intention. And uh, in fact, an anti, uh, an, an intention in the other direction, uh, an intention to to create a space in which you could get away from uh, the noise, the great cultural noise that we live in, and spend time in a world in which uh, people are more complex than their simple political views um, and a world in which meaning is possible rather than the, you know, either complete meaninglessness of much of what passes through our portals or even worse in a way, really reductive, stupid meaning. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I, I feel as if the fiction writer nowadays is, could be, maybe even ought to be um, trying to preserve a space in which people encounter one another as people. Um, the, the reader encounters the writer, the reader encounters people who he or she or they may recognize. Um, and and it's about a human connection rather than always jumping to, frankly, what is the political advantage in this? We have a question from Pam who asks, are there authors you've come to later in your career that are now a big influence, especially um, in your current writing? Yeah, that goes to the surprise element. Um, I do like surprises. That, comes probably from my character flaw of being easily bored. But uh, yes, I can point to a number of books that really redirected me. Um, uh, in the 90s, it was Paula Fox, um, Jane Smiley's early work, uh, Halder Loxness, Independent People. And um, I think with freedom, I found my way to Stondahl, who I'd overlooked. Uh, to my detriment. Um, later on with Purity, I, I, I'd tried Murakami, I'd tried some of the wrong books like The Wild Sheep Chase, and, and, and I found my way to the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And it was, it was like, I would, I'm never gonna write a book like The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And yet what he's doing here uh, is so, there is something really, I don't know, it just like cleaned all the pipes up in my head. and. And, and made me want to write fiction again. Um, and probably most recently, two books I would mention, one would be um, Ferrante's ne Neapolitan novels. They were very much on my mind as I was working on Crossroads and imagining a trilogy. Um, and, uh, and then very recently, Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate, which maybe, again, not something I, I would not want to write a 1200 page novel about the Battle of Stalingrad. But um, it, he, he really got something that I'd been groping toward while working in Crossroads, he crystallized uh, for me. 
And, and that really can be summarized as uh, a stress on the importance of kindness. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, I'm, 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 I'm always looking for that book that's going to just, that is going to, that will, that will be, for me as a reader, what I'm looking for the story to do for me as a writer. Something that is, oh, I didn't think I was going to go that way. Oh, I'm not done. Um, I've not, I'm not bored as a reader. I'm not bored as a writer. Um, there's, there's still something new and great and life-changing out there. We're going to hear from one of my GBH colleagues um, about a fundraising message in just a moment. But before that, there was one short question um, that I thought you might be able to answer. This comes from Kevin, who asks, are the Hildebrands White Sox fans or Cubs fans? Cubs fans. Yeah, they're suburban. They're kind of they're they're suburban, I think. Um, and and I have done a little writing on a subsequent volume and um it appears that at least one of those Hildebrands goes on to become a Cubs fan when you say um subsequent writing um what, what pages. Do you mean exactly I mean pages okay yeah. <laughs> um so we are now going to uh turn to my colleague uh Sandy Chin who is joining us to share a special offer with everyone um Sandy welcome and take it away from here thank you so much Jeremy, thank you to everyone at home. Hello, I'm Sandy Chin with GBH's Member Engagement. And thank you for joining us this evening for our Beyond the Page event. And there's something very special about a community of people brought together by their love of reading. And if you enjoy Beyond the Page events, like tonight's event with Jonathan Franzen, please consider supporting this series by donating to GBH as a sustainer. Sustainers serve as a steady and reliable source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and programming on air and online. You watch or listen to GBH programs all year long, so why not spread out your support of GBH throughout the year and become a sustainer today? When you give $5 a month tonight as a GBH sustaining member or a one-time gift of $60, you will receive Jonathan Franzen signed paperback edition of Crossroads as a token of our thanks to you. And in this book, Franzen takes us back into the past, 1971, I believe was the year he said, and explores the history of two generations with characteristic humor and complexity and with even greater warmth, he conjures a world that resonates powerfully with our own. And Crossroads is yours as a thank you gift for donating tonight to GBH. And there are three ways to give. You can visit gbh.org slash support events or text GBH to 800-204-3811 using the keyword GBH to donate or scan the QR code here on the screen behind me now to open the secure donation form on your smartphone. And you can give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once. It's that easy. Go to gbh.org slash support events or click on that link you see in the chat and contribute what you can. And we are so excited you're here with us and Jonathan Franzen tonight and hope we can continue to have your support to be able to create more events like this one. And to all of those who are already supporting GBH, we thank you. And now back to Jeremy and Jonathan. Thank you so much, Sandy. And we are gonna continue our discussion with Jonathan Franzen. As a reminder, I just wanted to let everybody know that you can keep adding your questions into the Q&A tab. Um, and once you put them in there, um, you'll be able to see other people's questions and you can give a thumbs up to them to upvote different questions. I'll try to get to as many as I can tonight. We have one um, person who is anonymous um, who asked a difficult question. Maybe that's why they want to stay anonymous. They uh, comment on your use of the word family and ask how you would define a family. Oh, how I would, well, hmm. <clears throat> this, this, has, this has the feel of a trick question somehow. Um, uh, I, 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 I think I would probably begin um, by noting that uh, unlike baby quail, 
um, baby human beings are not born able to take care of themselves. And uh, typically, particularly in industrialized society, care for children falls to the family. Whatever that family looks like, it does not have to be a normative family. It, families come in all shapes and sizes and flavors. But nevertheless, uh, there will be some primary caregivers for a child. And that experience, particularly when it's compounded by a genetic relation with the, with the parenting figure, um, but not exclusively, uh, that leads to a sense of, well, this, these are important people in my life. And, and it goes the other way too, for the parenting figure, um, that child or that set of children um, become very, very important. And, and because that is happening um, at such an important and formative time in a person's life, uh, particularly for the child, that's what I mean. Um, that that there be, you, you, a whole set of expectations, obligations, connections, and in many cases, powerful love become an element of that. And so you have. I mean, family could also be defined as the place where psychology is intense, emotions are intense. Um, Conflicts, even if they're mostly avoided, tend to be very extreme when they come to the surface. Um, and, and it's what we talk about. You know, we talk about our mom or our stepmom or wh whoever. Um, uh, and we talk about our kids and our grandkids. So that's what the family is, I think. I don't think Miriam Webster would like that definition. <laughs> As you talk about it, I'm bringing up some, you know, difficult things potentially um, being around family, you know, in at least two of your books, you have families gathering um, around Christmas. And I think like around that time, a lot of people have that similar experience of if they're trying to be a different person in some way or another, returning to family around something like Christmas, feeling their younger self come back to the fore in some sort of way, which can cause tension. In your books, you know, we follow your characters from such a young age with their family, with the people who are shaping who they are potentially or shaping their initial relationships, at least in the world. And you do see them in some ways reverting to those old tensions um, and relationships with their family. I'm curious if you think that people change and if your characters change or if they are the same people as they were in childhood with those families? I think by the time you're 30 years old, it's very difficult to change. And I think most people don't. I don't think I have. Um, what, what may look like change from the outside or from a therapeutic perspective um, involves something closer to accepting what you are, um, <clears throat> getting to know better what you are, uh, getting to know better the mistakes you tend to make and maybe starting to avoid those. Um, but I, 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 think, I think personalities are pretty well set and the effort to change yourself usually fails. And of course, that's fertile ground for a novelist. Um, the tragedy, but also the comedy of attempted self-transformation, self-improvement. Um, the story comes to mind of the the, 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 the type A guy, and this is uh, the sister-in-law tells the story. They had a Buddhist neighbor. It wasn't always Buddhist. He was like some hard driving banker. And you know, what kind of Buddhist did he become? He became one of those aggressive <laughs> Buddhists. Um, and it was like, I'm going to do this right, and I'm going to be the best Buddhist on the block. Um, this was in the East Bay, by the way. Uh, yeah. Need I even add? Um, and, you know, it's like I resorted to becoming a Buddhist in order to change myself, but he didn't really change. He just became a Buddhist. Um, so, no, I don't think people change by and large. 
there, I was just flashing on uh, a word choice Shakespeare makes early in Winter's Tale. Um, Leontes, I think, is talking about his close friendship with, I believe it's Polixenes, um, and, you know, a relationship so, so strong and deep could not help but branch. And in Elizabethan English, that would mean um, flourish, put out branches, not just be the little skinny stalk, but actually put out branches. But of course, it also means when you branch, you're going in separate directions. Um, and it's a cool image of, particularly for the parent-child relationship, in that you, you know, you share these roots, and when the child is young, you really are, you know, you're you're almost indistinguishable. You're just like there's a trunk, and then comes the time, if the if the organism is healthy, it should branch. But there is, I think that's that's where a lot of the um, the drama of being part of a family comes from is that, you know, kids grow up and they are going, they are not the same as you and they're going to do their own thing. And, and, and any attempt to resist that branching is going to create drama. You mentioned the, um, you mentioned the sort of tightrope of tragedy and comedy with people attempting to change themselves and how that's ripe for, someone like you who's writing about it. We have a question along uh, the lines of that from Jack who writes, how do you move so seamlessly from a comedic to a tragic tone in your novels? Walking that tightrope seems incredibly difficult. Thank you, Jack, for the question um, <clears throat> and the implicit compliment. Uh, and in spite of my best efforts, sun is fun. It's like this is a little pinhole of sunlight trying to find me. Um, in spite I'm of jealous four, with you in California. It's dark. I know. I've, off. I've got four sh four sheets of newspaper taped to the Venetian blinds, and it's still finding its way in. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, I, th I think the answer that comes to mind is that the two modes are actually very similar. If you look at um, if you look at one of the canonical texts of recent decades in American literature, Jesus's son, Dennis Johnson's book, it's a hilarious book. And he's also recounting absolutely horrific things. Um, and I think if you bore down on the prose and the rhetorical essence of those sentences, you'd find they're basically identical, whether he's recounting something horrific or something comic. And it is, it's a deeply held conviction of mine that the comic and the tragic are very, very close together um, to, to the point of almost being indistinguishable. It's just a choice. Are you going to laugh at this or are you going to rend your garments over this? Uh, so uh, that's, that's maybe not a very helpful craft tip. Um, but I think you're looking Here's, here's what comedy and tragedy have in common um, on the, in a work of literature. And I'm so sorry about this spot. Um, uh, I just keep noticing there's this white <laughs> thing on the screen. Everything else is like properly toned. Um, let me try this. Does this work? Maybe better. Um, it, in order to laugh, and particularly to laugh at something difficult or dark, you have to have distance from it. Um, distance in time, distance in having kind of processed it emotionally and being able to look at it more coolly for what it is. Um, and, and I am a fan of writing that has that kind of distance. Um, because it makes me feel comfortable as a reader. When I feel as if I'm getting some unprocessed, somebody who's still like in the emotional grip of the story they're telling, um, some unprocessed emotional narrative, uh, I start to worry. I think, oh, am I being made as a reader party to some, some private thing that the, that's going on with the writer? 
uh, and, 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 and it also makes me not necessarily trust the writer's account. Um, when the writer has processed something to the extent, to, to, to the point where they can present it in this beautiful neutral place where it could be tragic, it could be comic, but in any case, with this, with this distance, um, then, I, then I relax. Then I feel like, okay, I can go there um, and I can join in the, in the writer in that experience. Um, we have one question that I think touches on what you're saying a little bit. This is a question about Perry in Crossroads. And for me, reading Perry, there was so much immediacy to a lot of the chapters devoted to him. So it's interesting hearing you talk about um, that distance. Jenna asks, how much are you like Perry? Which I think also goes back a little bit to that question of you know where you get particular characters or elements of characters from. But to ask Jenna's question, how much are you like Perry? I had a fairly large vocabulary myself when I was 15. Um, <clears throat> but unlike Perry, I wasn't cool uh, because I wasn't, I wasn't into the drug scene. And that was the thing about high school, at least in the 70s, is if, 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 if you were like in this complicit community of drug users, you were just like automatically cool. Uh, and if you weren't, then there was <laughs> this is just the suspicion that you weren't cool. Um, so in that respect, we're very much alike. He, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I have my moderate addictions um, and from which I can extrapolate what it's like to be really in the powerful grip of an addiction. Um, uh, have I had a really bad experience with cocaine? Well, actually, yeah, I, 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 enough of an experience to decide this is an evil drug. Um, it is a drug that serves one purpose, which is to make you want to have more of it. Um, do Did I reach a point where I believed I was God? Um, no. Uh, which, by the way, is, I think, a, a good example of the, the comic and tragic thing. I mean, when a person is mentally ill enough to, to say to himself, oh, hey, I'm God, and to, and to really feel I have, I have actual godlike powers, well, that's, a, that's objectively speaking um, a terrible place for a person to get to. And yet, of course, it's also hilarious. He thinks he's God. I mean, it's like, it's funny, right? Um, and that's uh, maybe getting back to the previous question about, uh, perhaps it was from Jack. Um, uh, there, there is, you want to kind of keep, keep open the possibility that something is both the most awful thing that's ever happened and really the, the funniest thing that's ever happened. Um, another question about characters in Crossroads. Claire asks, is there a character in Crossroads whose perspective is easiest or most fluid to write? Well, yeah, Perry. Again. Really? Yeah, Perry. Well, Perry, because because I didn't have to hold back. Um, uh, I'm... Like I guess then you could get things you wanted to say out there or... Um, well, just the, the manner of saying it, God damn, this little spot of light, like, where is it? I'm looking at this bank of newspapers here. <laughs> I can like, say I'm not noticing it. Okay, well, let's put it on my throat. Um, uh, Perry, because, um, because I do think in long, complicated sentences, um, and when rendering a character who isn't operating on that level of articulateness, I have to kind of dial it back. Uh, with Perry, I could just be as <laughs> ridiculously long, not long-windedly, but um, convolutedly articulate as I felt like. And to, to actually get to, you know, normally I have a sensor saying, don't do that, don't do that. Um, but Perry gave me permission to do that because he was, he was described as that super bright kid. Colin asks, assuming you have based characters on people from your life, has your writing affected your per personal relationships with friends and family, positive or negative? Uh, thankfully, not to my knowledge, has it had a negative effect. Um, 
the corrections was the book that had that took the most from my my personal life um and 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 three of the five main characters in that actually four of the five main characters that in that are pretty much drawn from life uh you know with exaggerations of course um and uh, two of them were dead by the time the book was published and one of them was i didn't really know very well and we had an awkward moment when we met at a party some years later uh, and one of them was my brother bob and uh he'd already told me there's nothing you could write that will make me stop loving you and i put it to the test <laughs> um and but you know that's I, 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 I say that lightly, but um, okay, I have it over here. Um, every time I look down at the screen, I see the spot again. Um, I say that lightly, but in fact, um, one of the reasons it took me so long to write the corrections was I had to spend several years working out in my mind um, the ethics, which is to say the permission uh to 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 write what i felt i needed to write um and i and i also so my what i would say is if you have declared yourself to be a writer if people if if if, if your family and friends know that's what you do um then i think you've essentially served fair warning <laughs> um, that, that you are paying attention to things and writers don't write in a vacuum. They use things they hear, they use things they're involved in. Um, so there's, so you get a little bit of permission from that alone. Uh, and then it's a matter of, you do have loyalties and there's a loyalty to your writing and then there's a loyalty to the people you care about and um, especially early on, I, for instance, would was at pains not to take anything from life because uh, I I didn't I didn't have enough loyalty to myself as a writer yet. Um, that's something that comes with time and, frankly, with some success. Um, so, but no, to answer your question, I have not. To my knowledge, I'm not thinking of any fallout. F. Pat um, writes that scenes in Crossroads imagining the church and teen relationships in the mid 70s were so spot on to me. Um, did you research, uh, did research aid you in writing this or is there some personal experiences that informed that? I know you've spoken a little bit about your teenage relationships and the difference with Perry, but Oh, oh no no well i was i was that. in a i was in a crossroads like youth group for six mm -hmm. years um so uh, and and but even there there had been research because i'd written about uh, my experience of that group in the new yorker many years earlier and um <clears throat> frankly on the new yorker's dime i'd gotten to travel and see some other people who'd been in the group and uh i they'd given me a lot of their own recollections so I started with notes. Um, I had actually had a large body of notes from, from a, based on my conversations with alumni of that group. Um, and I was able to remember much more um, about the specific things that happened in, in a group like that than I would have been able to on my own. Um, so in that sense, yes, I guess I did do research. I just didn't realize I was doing it for a novel. Um, by and large, I don't like to do research. I'd rather imagine and then fact check uh, later. Um, and but in the case of, you know, I didn't know anything about really about the Mennonites and I didn't know enough about uh, the Navajos. Um, so I did a lot of reading on those subjects. Um, Debbie asks if you are still reading while you're writing. And if you are, how do you have time for both, are you a speed reader? Um, she says, I could spend a day reading and not finish the book. A day? <laughs> I could spend a month reading and not finish a book. Uh, no, I'm the slowest reader. I think something went But do you wrong. read while you're writing? I mean, in the same room? 
no, at the same time, or do you oh, at the same time, writing and oh no, there's a time. No, writing is in the morning, and then other things are in the afternoon, and typically reading is in the evening. There's plenty of room for that, and um, and uh, I'm not afraid to read good stuff when I'm writing. Um, it's of course painful to pick up a book, you pick up like, or you pick up the New Yorker. Here's George Saunders being George Saunders. It's like fuck, wow, <laughs> how does he do that? He's so good. I don't have, I can't do that. And then, you know, and then like, I, I go back to the desk in the morning thinking I'm a terrible, mediocre writer. And then, you know, then I kind of reread and say, well, I can't do what he does, but I, what I did yesterday, it's not so bad. Um, but I, so I fi actually find it enlivening to read really good things while I'm working, but I know not everyone feels that way. Mark asks, what keeps you interested? in your craft? What keeps me interested in my craft? So I mentioned earlier that I think I've spent eight years of my life writing novels. Um, I can recall it 10 or 12. Um, that's not counting all the years of trying to write novels, but actually being in a book and having the pages and chapters coming out. Um, <clears throat> it's only about 10% of my, I mean, 25% uh, of my adult life has been spent in the state of actually working well on a novel at most 25%. But that's the best 25%. Um, that's if I don't like the word happy. Are you happy? I don't know if I'm happy. No. Maybe. What does that mean? What does it mean to be happy? Um, but I can say when I am not engaged in writing a novel that I, in hindsight, boy, was I happy. Um, uh, and it's especially notable in contrast to how not happy I am not being in the state of writing a novel. So that's what keeps me at it. It's a wish to be back in that state where I know what I'm doing every day get up and write another page um, and 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 that also that state of gargantuan obsession one gets into where I have thought about the thing and have been working on the thing for a number of years and it's all loaded 24 hours a day in my head and um, uh, which is, you know, arguably a form of mental illness, but uh, especially since it involves a made up world I'm living in um, rather than the real world. But but it's also, um, yeah, I just feel alive. It's like I'm, I'm in a totalizing relationship with something for as long as it takes to write the book. And that experience is so wonderful. I, I will never stop trying to get back to being in that state. Do you ever get separated from that state when you're in it, when you're working on a specific project? Is it ever you have to put it down and it feels awful because you do? That's a good question. Um, not so much. I mean, lately, in, in recent years, um, I've interrupted work on a book to go take a trip for bird watching. Um, uh, but I think I think for weeks at a time the whole project remains loaded. Um, I'm still thinking about it night and day, awake or sleeping. I'm still thinking about it. Um, so, no, the times when I w have had to take a break because uh, because I'm not working because I, I can't go any further, uh, those typically. Well, there are two flavors of that. One flavor is the, okay, now I need to stop and figure out what the hell is going on with Becky. Um, but that's fine because I'm still going to the office every morning. I'm still engaged in the work. But the other th thing is I, I'm not, I, uh, there's something wrong with this whole thing. Um, so no, generally when I encounter something like you just described, it means the project is probably dead. Um, we have uh, another question um, that looks back at your career a little bit. Uh, Kara asks how you feel like you've seen your own writing evolve since the 27th City, which was your first novel, for people who might 
How have I seen what evolve? Your own writing evolve. How do you feel like you've seen it evolve? Oh, I'm all too practiced at talking about that. And I've, you know, I, um, I went through a real reassessment in the nineties and I wrote about it in a big essay. Um, and although that's, you know, is that evolution or is that conscious design? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I just have to flash back to the question on um, <laughs> about uh, fam about people reacting to seeing themselves represented in work of mine. Um, sure. uh, I think it was a GBH thing. I think it was a call in show um, and with with a, like a national audience. Could that be something? I know it was in Boston and uh, you know, I was halfway through and the next caller, I went, Bob in Portland, Bob, Bob in Portland has a question. Bob in Portland's question was, how do you feel about using family stories in your fiction? Thank you, Bob in Portland. <laughs> that was my brother, of course, um, <laughs> uh, who had found out about the show and had called in to ask that question. Ha ha, his little revenge. Um, I would say that the evolution I've been most aware of and that really um, resulted in Crossroads was uh, a, a moving ever farther from a point of anger, uh, a place of anger in my fiction, um, and not coincidentally also moving ever farther from a place of moral judgment in my fiction. Um, a wish to be kind to my characters and simply represent them as they might want them represented themselves. Uh, and, and, a, and sadly, a certain kind of uh, over the top comedy has had to be sacrificed to that evolution. Um, that's the thing that comes to mind. We're getting towards the end here, so we only have time for a couple or a few more questions. We have thank you, everyone, one... for the questions, by the way. Um, yeah, thank, uh, these have been fantastic questions, and there are unfortunately more than we'll be able to get to, but I've loved reading them, and it's been fantastic hearing John's answers to them. Joe asks, does writing fiction improve your nonfiction authorship and vice versa? I mean, you talked a bit about your you know previous relationship with the Crossroads, a program similar to Crossroads and writing a New Yorker article. When I was reading um, Crossroads, I was also thinking about your essay about smoking and one character's relationship and Crossroads to smoking as well. But how do the two crafts, which I mean, you do a lot of both, how do they inform each other? Um, <clears throat> well, the anger had to go somewhere <laughs> and it went into the nonfiction, um, basically. Um, they, they, and also a certain kind of overt social commentary, which I was still doing in my first two novels. Uh, that was the first thing to go. That's just seemed much better suited to uh, nonfiction. Um, and, but it does happen that while pursuing a nonfiction piece, I will have an experience that will find its way into fiction. And in fact, it was while doing research for a, um, a piece in the New Yorker that I met the character who um, made me want to write Crossroads. So it, it goes both ways, but mostly the things that I think are not essential to fiction. And I do think um, politics, moral judgment, um, and I would even say at this point in my life, anger, that they're in the, um, the, the nonfiction has proved a, a good place to go with, with those feelings. Um, so we'll have time for two more questions. I'll do one probably difficult and big one and one fun one before we say goodbye to you. So this first one has to do with religion. And um, I mean, you talked about Crossroads being a family novel. Um, it also is a novel that centers a lot on religion and family and people's different relationships with religion. Um, this anonymous person is asking about your own relationship with religion. They say, as someone who is so scientifically minded, would you say you struggle with faith or call yourself an atheist? And I'm curious how your own views on religion also went into Crossroads. 
No, faith has never been a struggle. I simply never tried. Well, that's not quite true. I tried a little bit in my 30s, but um, no. Uh, <clears throat> the the supernatural seems really pretty implausible to me. I mean, there are some mysteries at the at the root of our science. There is the mystery of how nicely mathematics describes the natural world. There's there are there are some unanswered questions about uh, uh, how the Big Bang happened um, and when you when you spend time, especially with those cosmological questions, um, you do feel like you're getting into the realm of the theological to some extent. Um, but well, I'll just say that <clears throat> the theology has always specifically bored me. Um, and yet I'm interested in religion and I'm interested in the stories um, and I'm interested in the phenomenon of belief, even though I don't uh, experience it myself. Um, and, and because I was raised in a church, uh, the stories that were told in that church became foundational to me, as they used to be for almost everyone in the country. Um, it used to be we all had like we all do the stories in the Bible, and that is that's no longer the case. In fact, it's the more educated half of the country that no longer knows those stories. Um, so uh, it was <clears throat> it was fun as a storyteller to make use of the stories from the Bible. Um, particularly the story, uh, the stories that are told in the book of Acts, but it was, it was fun and easy to do a pastor because I know the Bible really well. And when he, when Russ, the main adult male character in the book, when he's, um, <clears throat> he's pursuing an adulterous relationship with a woman in the church, um, and, and he denies to his son three times that he's doing any such thing. I know where his mind goes. His mind goes to Peter <laughs> denying uh, that he has anything to do with this guy, Jesus. Um, that's after the Last Supper. Um, so these, I, 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 I think the stories are incredibly rich and foundational. And, um, and for me, that's enough. And the ethics behind them, the ethics that still underlies uh, basically liberal politics, progressive politics, that's a Christian ethics fundamentally. Uh, it's, it's, it's simpatico without being a matter of belief for me. When you're writing about characters who at least on the surface seem to have such deep belief, is that difficult for you? Or do you believe that your characters do have that belief? Like as someone who you're saying you, you yourself do not have that I don't know. Is that something you struggle with, with, with writing a book? Like no, I know. Believe, no, I, I, I know believers. So, and I, and I, there, I've, I have loved people who really do have a strong faith in God. And that's all it takes as a novelist. Just do you, do you know somebody who you respect and love who has this experience? It's not so hard then. I mentioned our last question would be a fun one. Chuck asks if you weren't writing what do you think you would be doing in lieu of it? I'd spend a lot of time bird watching, that's for sure. Um, Could you be a professional bird watcher, though? You can be kind of a professional conservation advocate. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that I don't have a retirement plan because I still am pursuing that 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 great experience of being in a novel. Um, and I'll, and, you know, until I lose my faculties, I'll probably keep pursuing that. Um, but I do, um, I am frustrated because there's a whole lot of advocacy that we need on behalf of the natural world. And uh, sometimes I think, why am I writing these novels? Um, why am I not just out being a full-time advocate? But, the novel needs advocates too.
Well, Jonathan Franzen and everyone joining us tonight, thank you all so much for tuning into this evening's Beyond the Page. And John, really, thank you so much for this incredible conversation and for answering everybody's questions today and for giving us a glimpse into the situation you have going there. That is amazing. There you go. Um, Jeremy, you had the hard job. Thank you very much. And thanks for everyone who uh, has stuck with this conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And we hope everyone had an amazing evening with us. I'm also very excited to announce that next month's Beyond the Page will be with the acclaimed theatrical adapter, Lolita Chakrabarty and director Max Webster to tell us about the creative secrets behind the modern classic Life of Pi and what it was like turning the epic story into a stunning award-winning play. You can register for that free event now with the link that is being sent out in your chat. And truly everybody and John, thank you so much for an awesome discussion. And everybody, please have a great night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.